Received comments of the community members regarding the teachers' benefits as a public hearing for the teachers' bargaining. Okay. Certainly. Um, so, this is a requirement uh, by ERB for the start of bargaining. We had uh, two reopeners in our two year contract that would extend through the end of 2024. Uh, the first one is our increase in students. If we had an increase in students over last September to this September of 75 students or more, then we would come to the table to discuss salaries. Um, right now, it's not looking like 75 students, um, more like 25 to 30 right now that we're increasing. But our other reopening statement in there that we had uh, that would bring us both to back to the table would be our health insurance, if we had an increase in health insurance rates. Uh, within our contract, our current contract right now, we have a defined contribution for our um, what the corporation will pay towards those plans. Our increase in calendar year 2022, because those insurance rates are on calendar years, uh, was a 3% overall increase. And in 2023, I'm happy, very happy uh, to announce that it's looking like a 2% increase. Although it's still a 2%, but 2% is much better than what I'm hearing from other school districts. 8% uh, is like an average, 14% is not unusual. So our 2% is great within our, um, our own insurance. And again, uh, we joined the trust uh, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, and it's paying off obviously with our rates here. So the defined contributions that we have in here that the corporation will pay towards uh, the plan are right now single plans. Uh, the district pays $9,759 towards it. Employee plus child, the district pays $16,537. Employee plus spouse, uh, we pay $18,353. Family plan, uh, the district play, pays $22,662 towards that. There are defined contributions in there as well for if we have two employees um, in the bargaining unit that are both employed within the district <coughs> that are generous. So um, with the increase that we have, uh, we met with parties uh, on Monday of last week at campus, and we, or this week, that's just this week, right? Yeah. So we met Monday this week, and we both decided that uh, we would go through bargaining to discuss the contribution rates since there was an increase. So at this point, um, we're having our public hearing. If anyone would like to speak on behalf of anything uh, within the contract that deals with the opener, which is health insurance here, um, I will hand it over to you to open it up for a comment. Right? Anybody have any comments? Any questions? Or any questions or yeah, comments or anything? Any questions? We do have two members from the bargaining unit here. Do you guys have any questions or anything you want to say? I don't think so. Michelle Pine and Mary Sinan here. I would think you about that. Okay. <laughs> And at that point, if there's no questions or comments, then we can close the public hearing. Superintendent's report. So yesterday was the e-learning day in the district, and I remember a lot of kids were learning at home with great enthusiasm. Our staff, <laughs> our staff was engaged in learning about our new protocols of the three outs, get out, take out, and lockout. And um, I 
see that we have an audience member here who is part of the safety team. And so it's Jason, so don't let him off the phone. <laughs> so Jason and Michelle and Stacy, our safety coordinator, indicated that either one of you may be interested to report how things went yesterday. We can go first. Sure. We both did different groups, so yeah. I guess both can say something. Sure. So I did the middle school and high school. Um, we had about 146 people sign in for the training. So quite a good attendance. Um, we got estimated a little lower, so that was good that we had more people turn out than we had. Um, but yeah, we spent two hours doing a, a PowerPoint presentation, and then um, folks go for lunch, then we did skills and um, scenarios after that, and we had a lot of thank yous, and this was really informative, and um, just teaching people skills that they could use here at school, but anywhere else they are in the case of an emergency. So the PowerPoint presentation Michelle's referring to was a review of case studies of active and shooter situations in, in the United States and identifying common themes and what we've learned from those studies and so our, our, all of our staff supported those presentations. And then Jason? Yeah, I was with the elementaries. Um, it was, like Michelle said, everybody was very receptive to it. I think the best part at, for the elementaries is we asked to Anybody learn anything that made them feel safer and everybody raised their hand. So I think that was a good point that everybody walked away with something. If it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't the hands on that they took, they took the case studies. And they can see like, uh, and Stacy's bringing up how she's following up with from kids from grade school to high school and watching all that, if there's any more in the sense. So I think it was, it turned out way better than I thought it did. So, you know, a big deal in school is keeping your classroom door locked throughout the school day. And when you work in a school, that can be very inconvenient. Every time you're in the middle of teaching and every time somebody comes to the door, whether it be a kid coming to the restroom or uh, an instructional assistant that's coming by or whatever, it's a little bit of inconvenience. The, the hope is that after yesterday and looking at the case studies, and what a big presenter keeping classroom doors that it makes it worth it. The inconvenience is worth, um, you know, doing that. So it seems like some good uh, feedback. And the the nice thing about the three hours is simple and easy to remember. And the goal is that you could walk up to anybody in the hallway in any part of our district and say, "What's the protocol for?" all about simplicity because you don't have time in a situation to grab the name now and turn to the situation of what should I do. So I, I, to add to that, I think of the, the three outs is it's not linear. So when you're in a certain situation, you don't have to take one piece of it. You can use whatever is the best option for you at that time. So if it's get out, then you just get out instead of just trying to run through a locked door. So I think it gives it gives staff more options to do than trying to follow a strict policy on it. The next item of the report is uh, still along school safety is you've heard of the Sandy Hook Foundation, Sandy Hook Promise, uh, spearheaded from the tragedy at uh, out east. So there's a component that we've talked about before. There's an anonymous reporting system called Say Something. And uh, it's free of charge. We will be the second school district in Indiana, all of Indiana to have access to this resource. Um, oftentimes there are waiting lists to, to be able to be a part of the program. So we're, we're quite fortunate in that regard. Sandy Hook provides professionals that man the uh, online system, the phone lines, 365 days a year, 24 hours of all of those days. And when they get a tip or a report, whether that be someone who's thinking about harming themselves or others or someone who's reporting something suspicious, they are specifically trained to 
triage that, what is life threatening right now, to what can wait until the next business day. And then they have avenues to inform school personnel if it's wait to the next business day. If it's life threatening, they call the local 911 dispatch. They call the school safety team who uh, all of the people who are on the list and they also call the team at the district level notifying those three teams the objective is to uh, basically do a well-being check law enforcement may not have all the information that they need such as we've got a name but we have no idea who their parent is or where they live so school can you work on it collaborate with us and help us fine tune on where we can go to do a well-being check. Uh, our team has done initial orientation. There is a student component that will take place in the upcoming weeks where there's an approximately 30 minute video, grades six through 12, that will educate kids on how to make a report and, and um, what type of reports to make. And then um, we are looking at a launch, I believe approximately mid-October. So, very excited about that. And, uh, I will say two nights ago, on Tuesday night, we hosted a, a town hall meeting in this room. There were 13, 15 individuals that showed up. Uh, Michelle uh, White Rock was there. And um, she got to speak in regards to school safety, and I appreciated that. We had a variety of topics. Uh, school safety was the, the hot, the most urgent topic. Uh, people were glad to know that we have off duty police officers uh, circulating through our elementary schools now. And uh, we were able to educate about three hours to say something. We talked about social and emotional learning. Kathleen was there. And um, we also talked about mental health and our behavior specialist of Indiana uh, program we have in all three of our elementaries amongst, I don't know, a handful of other topics. So it was, it was a good time and uh, we were there about an hour and a half and uh, hope to host another one in October, take off November and December and probably pick it back up Thank you. Board member, I have some news from um, Co op. Um, Co op believes that Mary Dot Cummins has been there over the leading a couple of years. Uh, Co op believes they can weather that without having to do any more bankruptcies or anything like that. And if you have any more information about that as far as uh, well, cost increases to us, maybe? In, in short, um, when just seeking a look at the money that um, Maryville brings into the cooperative and the amount that they pay their assessment versus the resources for the amount of students they have in the program, um, they are, uh, the end result is we're carrying them, uh, that their costs are exceeding their revenues that are coming into the program. So that's what it is. There's, there's students, there's a lot more students in their population that are in program that are picking up stocks that um, all us other districts could be using too. So it's um, when you look at it just from a, a netting out point, they're, they're costing us. You know, we're carrying them. It's the easiest way to put it. So uh, with them leaving the cooperative, it's not going to affect us in any negative way. There are some hard true costs that we pay for, uh, such as school buses, but we'll have less students and we can go down the bus. Um, some of the capital costs to maintain Eagle Park there will be split by the remaining schools without Maryville in there. Uh, but still, it's not a ton of money that we're talking about that it would really change. We don't have a lot of needs there. So. And also, uh, the uh, co op uh, bills med Medicare for some of our students. Uh, bridge in revenue to them, which they pass on to us, is also used our, our payments that we've had to have. Now they they request a requested a, a 
some of that money themselves to use because they spend critical time making all the all the uh, billing to the to the feds and all. So so we're considering having them have a share of that to pay for a person to do all this because it's something us out. Yeah. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars when you take into the whole program. So it's increasing year over year. Yeah. And they've really they really got a process in place to get the, the people who are eligible to get them on board. I mean, it doesn't cost them anything. Yeah. Saying just do that. What? You can't vote. Okay. <laughs> All in favor by saying aye. Aye. All opposed saying sign. Motion passes. Good. All right, personnel. Uh, proof of personnel report dated Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. I'll make a motion. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor by saying aye. Aye. All opposed saying sign. Motion passes. Number two, approve the support staff salary schedule for the 21 22 and the 22 23 school year. So, this is a State Board of Accounts requirement. Um, we have to annually upload this into the gateway system. In the past, we've been able to upload our uh, listing that we have in our handbook that lists all the starting rates, and State Board of Accounts has been fine with that. Um, I'm noticing a trend in audits across the state in schools uh, that they are now um, putting audit comments in there if you don't have a low and a high on the hourly rate for support staff in your resolution that you're uploading. So what you have before you, um, I, I'm correcting what we, uh, our, our schedule from last year because I only had the starting rates in there last year. So I added the highs for last year for the 2021-22 school year. And then I also have 2022 and 23 in here. So this is just the starting rate for each position um, on our support staff and the highest paid rate, highest paid person on our books right now. So I'll address the rates. I'll make a motion. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of saying aye. Aye. All opposed saying sign. Motion passes. All right. One the proof of Lowell Middle School extracurricular handbook. Yeah, so the middle school said that they didn't have one and so they created one. And they would like to present that to you tonight for approval. Just to help the purposes to keep it right on the same page regarding extracurriculars that uh, do not totally encompass the athletic. Practices are already in play, they just created a three or four documents. It's a good idea. I mean, their you know, extracurricular exercise uh, sports are just as important to their athletics. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor of saying aye. Aye. All opposed saying sign. Motion passes. Number two, approve the point, appointment of Diana L. Dam as the Tri, Tri Creek School Corporation representative to the Roll Public Library Board of Trustees effective October 1st, 22 through September 30th of 26. I'll make a motion to approve. Is this a demo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? 
All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed same sign. Motion passes. <laughs> Number three, adopt resolution 22-07, reimbursement resolution. Yes, this is the uh, Beck Thomas Peterson or Bonnie is in here uh, to help us go through all of these resolutions. Uh, this is starting the process for issuance of bonds in order to add on to our Lake Prairie Elementary School. Um, I can speak broadly on this project because let's just say the construction market is crazy with how much you can actually buy versus the dollar. So what we'd like to do is add on at least six classrooms um, and increase our cafeteria size there too. Uh, we have other projects that we can throw in there. If for some reason it comes in a lot less, but that's probably not the case. And again, I'm hoping to get six classrooms and a larger cafeteria um, in that space. So I guess you can go over the forms if that's okay, Thomas, please. Yeah. Okay. The two resolutions before you tonight start the process for financing and getting into the tax exempt bond market. The first is one that's required by the Internal Revenue Service called a reimbursement resolution, which from this day forward, should there be any expenses that Dana has to incur to get the process moving on the construction side, we'd be allowed to use bond proceeds when the bonds are ultimately issued to reimburse the school for those costs. Um, and the second is to approve the formative amendment to lease. This is the structure that we have done Frequently, Indiana School Finance for Construction uses building corporations as the actual issuer of the bonds. The building corporation then leases the facility to the school. The school pays lease rentals, which are magically matched to the debt service on the building corporation's bonds. And then under both statute and the contract, when the bonds are retired, the building corporation transfers the real estate back to the school at no cost. So I would suggest adopting both of these resolutions and that would set up a public hearing at your October 27th meeting. This is from your 2015 bonds, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, there's an opportunity to do a refunding there. Um, and to set that up. The whole trouble is, <clears throat> fun little things you may have heard the Fed just raised interest rates by three quarters of a percent. We don't know how that's going to affect the tax exempt bond market. Sometimes they go in lockstep, sometimes they actually even go opposite. But this would set us up to uh, do that. And right now, your uh, savings target is pretty close to about an 8% of what you would have paid in debt service to refund. It's kind of a relatively short maturity schedule left, but with the um, beneficial interest rates, it should be a savings, and that is after paying off hospital insurance and everything else. So this would set up and authorize um, Dana and then uh, Stiefel, your underwriters, Mr. Elizondo, to prepare to go to the market so that when they see something favorable, they'd be able to sell bonds and lock in your savings. But there's no guarantees that it would actually happen because, as Dana was saying, with construction prices, we don't know where interest rates are going. And if I did know, I wouldn't be here this evening. I'd be on a beach with an umbrella and a train, <laughs> and we go from that. So again, this sets us up so that we'll be in position to strike should the market be favorable. So I would suggest all three resolutions. <laughs> Motion to uh, adopt resolutions 2207, 2208, and 2209. I'll second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor of saying aye. 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 All opposed and sign. Motion passes. I'll see you on the 27th. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Number six, approve the proposal for the initiation of the Lowell High School Red Devils Page Turner's Club. The proposals will be to promote a love for reading and writing among students at the Lowell High School. Club sponsors are Dan Kuzma and Amy Mikkelbitz and Lindsay O'Neill. Yeah, they're not here, it's just me. So. <laughs> um, 
Um, can I come up there? Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Just get closer. Um, I like to talk a lot, so I try to leave notes so I wouldn't take too much of your time. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. Angela just said that he wanted to hear a little bit about the club. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So um, the reason why I think that we need uh, a club that focuses on literacy at the high school is because several years ago, um, the middle school humanities teachers worked really hard to develop a program within their school um, to promote a love of reading. And they kind of broke many of the rules, I think, that they had been following previously about their literature in the classrooms and the curriculum. And uh, it was super successful. So I teach English 9. And as I'm watching students come into the high school, they are expecting to be pushed in their reading. And they're expecting to be rewarded for um, you know, finishing novels and keeping track of their reading and doing things that they actually enjoy reading. So we try to revamp our English 9 curriculum quite a bit to accommodate that love. Um, and then I kind of think that things fall off a little bit. So I want to bring sort of a culture shift to the high school um, to try to keep that love of reading. And as the kids, like I had a student this year, a ninth grader, come in and on the first day, he's like, Mrs. Molina, not only did I read your summer reading packet, but I also read The Odyssey this summer, and I read Frankenstein, and I read a six book series that started from a video game. Um, and so they, they really established this culture and love for reading, and I want to keep that going. So I don't really have concrete plans because I think that I want the students to be very involved in this. Um, Mrs. Mikevitz is another uh, English 9 teacher. She also teaches English 11 and Honors 11. She's new and she has, uh, her strengths are my weaknesses. So she's very much into young adult literature um, and into fantasy and all of these genres that I don't usually read. So she's going to be a great resource for students. And then Mrs. Kozma is very creative. She's our school librarian. Um, she often taps into the English 9 classes to try to promote her initiatives and the things that she has going on in the building. So I think that the three of us work together and establish a core group of students across grades 9 through 12 um, that we can use the student's voice to help promote this. So we're hoping for three to four ambassadors per grade level uh, this year and then kind of hammer out details and grow as a program and hopefully by next year it'll be better. Thank you. That sounds good. Very good. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You had uh, two ladies from Transform Consulting Group uh, present to you about a month ago. In that time, we asked them to put together a written proposal, which we shared in your board docs a couple of weeks ago for review. Um, that outlined the two phases that were really the crux of their presentation. Just to review that, the first phase is their facility uh, study, I'm sorry, feasibility study and implementation plan. That's really the learn phase. So as they map that out, it really would begin as soon as we have board approval and then move into about January, early February, the latest, and that's where we have community listening posts, surveys, and just a major needs assessment of like, what does our community want? Where are their gaps in trying to fill those needs? And how can we roll out a plan that would start to fill those with the best quality pre-kindergarten seats that we, can, that we can do? So through that, they would be the leads, and obviously they spoke to having a point of contact in the district that would then be bouncing back and forth what they're gleaning from our community. So truly identifying how many classes do we need, um, how many seats are desired, that kind of thing. So there are a lot of unknowns out there. 
we do know is that there are limited pre-K seats in our community right now as a number of our pre-K programs no longer exist and began going under either right before the pandemic or throughout it. So that is something that we've heard very real uh, in the facility study plans that we've had throughout last year. The second phase of that is based on all of that needs assessment, working in conjunction with the early learning committee members and of course the board, putting in an implementation plan and supporting us all along the way. So that's everything from curriculum, resources, setting, instruction, training, everything that we would need to make sure that as soon as that consultation agreement is completed, we are not only prepared, we are above and beyond prepared and equipped to run and sustain that program for years to come. So that guidance and that expertise is what makes the partnership so incredibly valuable to us because it's a very different world from K-12 education and we need that expertise. Um, I did make mention at that presentation that um, like all school districts that have ESSER funds, we wanted to make sure at Tri Creek that we use our ESSER funds to build capacity, that we weren't just necessarily at things that were one and done, but even when the funds were gone, programs would still be the result of investing in those relationships. Our partnership with Behavioral Supports of Indiana is a good example of that. This would absolutely follow in line with that. Um, I did reach out to the Department of Education for an initial review and feedback to see and confirm that this would be an ESSER allowable fund, and upon first review they said yes. So upon board review, I can formally click the submit button on that for a second review, and then we would hopefully get that approval relatively quickly and be able to do the partnership here in the fall. Okay. And these are not going to come out of our budget, this would be part of the budget. That is correct. And that would, yeah, and that would include both phase one and phase two out of those ESSER funds. Which again, I, I just like to validate that that's a great way to say that we invest in those in something that could be a program that could last generations of years of school corporation. Yeah, I like the fact that they had the alternative uh, revenue sources laid out for us. Yes, a lot of knowledge and expertise there for us. Do I have a motion? I have a motion. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of saying aye. Aye. All opposed and say. Motion passes. Uh, to approve the school improvement plans for the 22-23 school year. Yes, tonight we uh, present to you five schools improvement plans. Uh, I'll tag team with Kevin here. Uh, we, once the strategic plan was uh, developed, we then looked and brought the instructional leadership team of all the principals and assistant principals together in July, and we reviewed student performance data, uh, we looked at our strategic plan, the academic goal specifically, and we framed out uh, specific academic district level goals. And then Kevin and I sat down with each uh, principal to talk about their specific uh, goals for their particular buildings to ensure that we had alignment with the district goals. And um, once we kind of framed that out, then the principals, assistant principals, then went back to their buildings and um, worked with their school improvement teams, typically of their uh, team leader, assistant team leaders, and then they worked through those processes to ensure that building goals aligned with district goals, and district goals aligned with strategic planning goals. Anything else to add? I just think that um, we've shared like typical data points that are kind of like universal, that like at the district level you would say we want to achieve this, and then each of those buildings or grade levels has a role in that. So in the academic goals, you would see iLearn absolutely show up in there. Um, you would see NWEA, which is a formative piece that we use grades K through eight, and then you would see uh, SAT, which is now the graduating qualifying exam for our juniors at the high school level. So you're seeing major assessments that are going to like kind of build upon each other beginning as young as third grade to then heading all the way up into the 11th grade here is what really informed those uh, early level academic goals. I think um, to Mr. Anderson's point, the nice thing we do have an umbrella of the strategic plan that ensures each school is seeing what can I do to do my part to meet that overarching district goal in each of those areas. Because certain schools have extremely high math scores, so they may be focusing their SIP on an ELA goal while another school might be inverse to that. So. It makes it specific to their building instead of just a one-size-fits-all. 
our recommendation would be for you to approve uh, presented school board in time. I have a motion. I second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of saying aye. Aye. All those saying aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> board policy number one review and discuss the board policy 36 one five adjunct teachers. Yeah, so we're still floating this out there. It is on the agenda for the October discussion meeting with the teachers union. At our last meeting, Mr. Ward, uh, who was president when Mr. Kyle wasn't, uh, asked the question, are there board policies out there that we could take a look at uh, for schools who actually hired adjunct teachers? Uh, Dana did, uh, we uh, have solicitation on, online and really didn't have any uh, hits on that. But Kevin went to the A, the School uh, Curriculum Development Conference in Indianapolis on Monday and ran into some people who have hired, did you say four? It was uh, four people at their school, yeah. Four adjunct teachers. And so um, Deanne reached out to that school district today and was able to get her hands on a copy of the. Stephen County is that what's on it? Angola. Angola. So, okay. yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> so no action required is still just for information only. Uh, and so we uh, proceed, talk to the teachers union, and then um, we'll come back and at some point for it to take action or we'll take it off the agenda. So this has gone through the union process, Kevin? This has gone through the union process with the school? Yeah, Angola, yes, it went through it. They had a, a very lengthy discussion. She said it was a pretty long, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tough topic. Mm -hmm. It's a tough topic, but she said that they were in the situation where if they didn't have it, they would have filled, I think she said, four positions at the time of the meeting. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Number two, approve the uh, revisions to board policy 1614 Staff and student non fragmentation. Yeah. So we made some revisions and then we had some revisions to the revisions and we let it marinate and um, it's time to uh, present our recommendation to approve the revisions. I'll make a motion. I'll second that for a four month process. I have a motion to make one further discussion. All in favor of saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Yeah. <laughs> Send items. Uh, number one, approve the overnight set study trip for the Wolf High School Teacher Farmers of America to attend the 22 National FFA Convention and Expo in Indianapolis, Indiana, October 26th to 29th. It's cool, it's Indianapolis, one. Yeah. yeah. I would just point out, uh, if I may, there's a pork chop dinner tomorrow night uh, before the homecoming game. And Motion to approve. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Another, we're the only FFA in the county. So. Are we now? Yes. Yeah. I enjoyed being your staff. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to do. Was, uh, well, number two, accept the donation from the Creek Creeks Elementary School PTO in the amount of $197.45 to assist students with bookstore items for the start of the year. Number three, accept the donation from the Three Creeks Elementary School PTO in the amount of $401.21 to help fund the grade one study trip. I'll make a motion. I'll say, I have a motion to say. Any further discussion? All in favor by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Public participation number two. Mary?
right next to the top corner of the bricks. So I have just the horse that I want to kind of go through. I'm, I'm sure you know I've already spoken with Mr. Gilbert about some of my concerns. So um, first of all, they have just gotten worse over the years, especially since the old village rule got torn down. It's gotten progressively worse. I looked right next to it to those fields. Um, my biggest concern, I don't know if they are parents and or coaches, but they send players into my yard to urinate. There are two porta potties out there currently. It was just a few weeks ago when the little boy was up in my yard urinating on a tree. Players will climb trees, which is not a big deal. If you have a kid, that's fine. I don't care if they come up in my yard. Just don't damage the property. Clean up after yourself. Now, when they climb trees and they find a break, the wind's off, and the parent just watches and he does nothing, that's a concern to me, for sure. They will leave trash in my yard. The adults smoke on school grounds and then throw their cigarette butts in my yard. Coaches and parents, I personally caught them drinking after a practice the Saturday before school started. I did call the Wolf Police Department at that time, which the Wolf Police Department informed me that there is a contract between Pop Corner and the school district, and therefore they could drink. Did they find alcohol out there, the police? Yeah. And he said they are not inebriated. They were drinking. I walked away from them, back up into my yard, and watched the dads keep slamming the beer. There's no way they're allowed to drink on school property. What's that? Oh, they're not allowed to drink that's on school police officer told me. Well, he's wrong. Oh, well, that's what I thought. But he said they have a contract between the school. You don't need a contract about this man. No, he's wrong. But you don't allow No, 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 no. I think there was not a contract. Okay. Did you say there was not? That's what, that's what I was told. Who told you that? Uh, Well, then I'd like to have a conversation between me and you and those three or four coaches uh, that I'll, I'll speak to them. No, I asked for a conversation between me and you and them. Because then that means they're calling me a liar. And I am not a liar. Okay. I have I no reason to call. try to get anyone in trouble. I just want Pop Warner to be respectful of where they practice and realize this is a residential neighborhood. I understand. And for them to say that, I'm really disappointed. It leaves a bad taste in your mouth about Pop Warner. The Saturday that this happened, the music that they were playing after the practice was so loud. It was a very hot Saturday. I was inside, my air conditioning was running, the windows and doors were closed, and I could hear the music as though it were playing right next to me. Where are they doing this out here? Even where the, heck, the actual field itself is on the practice field, down the football field. The music plays from the pole barn up on the field. Okay. Okay. But the dads that were drinking that day, they were literally in the parking lot, that little strip of road that runs right there. That's where they were drinking. And their kids were right there. I don't care if you drink, just don't drink in that environment. No, there's no drinking well at school. No, there's not at all. So that oh, police, yeah. I think the police officer right. we need was to talk, called out that day. Andy, can you talk to the police department about it? There were two squads that came out. Oh, he, he, was, was the law firm or the he was adamant that I was in the wrong. Okay. I'm just letting you know that. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that. I appreciate that. This, this has been a long time coming. I was raised, if you have a problem, you go and talk to the person you have a problem with. You don't gossip and talk behind their back. I have every year gone to whoever is heading up Pop Warner and asked them how they're that kids are in my yard again, they're leaving trash, the music's loud, and it might stop for a couple of weeks if I'm lucky for the rest of the season, but it starts all over again the next year. Another big issue, parking on the end of my street, I realize it's a public street, but at times they partially block my driveway, making it difficult for me to get in when I come home from work, or if I need to leave. On one specific occasion, I stepped out there and asked one of the dads if he could move his truck. He said, sure. I turned to walk away to go get my vehicle, and he called back to me. You mean to say you can't navigate around these vehicles? And I turned around and said, that's not the issue. You are parked directly across from my driveway. You have a big SUV. I have a big SUV. When I go to back out, there's cars everywhere. There's very little room to navigate. That was the Issue. Um, let's see. 
parents were driving through my yard, of course, butts right up to the top of the school yard. We had to cut across there, jump the curb, drive through that field right there, cut through my part of my yard. They go around the barricade, which is the gate. Um, I would just ask that whoever has the power to, to please take some step, steps to rectify this. This is not a one time incident. This has been building for years and mostly impacts me because my yard is literally right there. Um, but I can tell you my neighbors on the block also have the same concerns that I have, but I'm the one who's here talking to. My next really big concern um, since the old middle school was torn down, those gates that were put up, they block our street, which of course now make it a dead end, which in and of itself is maybe not. And it's really not technical, but I'm sure many of you in here are aware of what happened yesterday. And I was just at the town board meeting and was thinking the same thing. If there is ever an emergency, the emergency room is the end of the room. That's exactly what it is. Um, you don't know, my neighbor's home burned. They lost everything. She has her work clothes on in her vehicle. They lost her four pets. Thanks goodness, no, nobody was home, but everything was gone. Emergency vehicles, my understanding is they tried to get through, but of course there were barricades up. So I was at the train, I left, I texted John and asked him if he was in some of the hotels at the gate, and somebody did come right away. But at that point, all the emergency vehicles were coming down this way on the street. They didn't even know that there was a fire hydrant right next to their house, and they went halfway down the block to get a hose. They lost a lot of time, but there were so many snafus that happened yesterday. I don't know that it would have changed the outcome, but I just, it's just frustrating um, that even residents who live on the next street have to go all the way around. And for sure, a safety issue a few years back when the previous neighbor lived there, um, one of them needed an ambulance, and the ambulance had come around. I don't remember if that second gate was open or not, but they got down to the gate right by my and of course it was locked. The ambulance had to go all the way back around. It just, it's heartbreaking. But, um, and if you were in that situation, I'm sure you would feel the same way that I do. I have some solutions though. I didn't just come here with problems. I have some solutions. I would propose putting in an electric gate with a key card, give it only to residents, charge us a deposit, whatever amount. I'm not here to propose that dollar amount, but so that we can get in and out of our streets, those of us that actually live on that street. Um, and that key card, it could be deactivated at any time if there was an issue. Um, and emergency vehicles should also have those mounted in their vehicles so that if they need to get through, they can just use that key card to get through. Um, going back to the gate being down, if Pop Warner had been there, there's no way those emergency vehicles could have gotten down the street. They were parked, so if there's a road, there's that gate. They are parked all the way down, well, sometimes halfway down the street, and sometimes even right smack in the middle. There will be three cars going across. And I don't think that's appropriate. It, should, it just shouldn't be happening. Um, if an emergency or if a town vehicle needed to get through, they didn't. I just wanted to bring those things to your attention because the lot more issues are going to be. I know we do, but yes, we have those um, electric gates that are Right, I know that, but, but I mean, usually we have to vote on it every so often. I mean, it surely there's a record of the officers that came out. I'm sure they have the link with them. I know one of them had a big white SUV. There was, a, I believe, a red Jeep. Yeah. I'm not sure we're going to be able to do anything about the street because it's not ours. The parking on the street? Yeah. I mean, well, I did go to the town and they said it's a public street and we're told that this is also a safety issue. Well, it's, but, it's with the town, unfortunately. Well, I mean, they said it's with the school. <laughs> so I don't want to get caught in between. Well, like, that that was that was that part of our new guiding principles to the category is focus on solutions. And we want to be a good community, 
neighbor partnership. So we can take a comprehensive look at taking notes of all the items that we reported on tonight. Thank you. I and we'll, that. and um, well, someone from my office will circle back around to you and just update you on the efforts that we've taken. I would really appreciate that. To me, it seems like an easy fix, but it's a key part. Nobody else can get that, read that, except the residents. I didn't talk with uh, I believe his last name was Gilbert, and if he's here, he's the high that debated the little boy urinated in my yard that day. I don't know anymore, but he's here. I don't know the guys anymore. I used to know them, but they're pretty usually pretty receptive. I know they've talked to the parents because there's some scheme of practices right there. They've talked to the parents, and that's already there, but it's. He didn't tell me that. He said, I've asked him. And I'm not sure this until the 15, but it's. And I see that there's fewer, there's less people coming in now, but. Right. There's and still up. There is. There. And I guess the kicker, no pun intended, is that there is a big parking lot there, half empty. There's no reason for them to right. park there, walk yeah. across yeah. the field. I want them to be respectful of my home, my neighborhood, that this is where we live. And they wouldn't want that happening where they live. So I guess that's just how I try to see things is how does my community affect my home. But I wouldn't want to do that to someone else. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Other information. Uh, to schedule a work session on Wednesday, September 28th, 2022, at 6 p.m. at the Wool Middle School cafeteria to discuss facility planning. To the board to schedule an executive session on Tuesday, October 4th, 22, at 1 p.m. at 201 North Illinois Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, to train the school board members with an outside consultant with performance of the role of the members of public officials. And number three, the next uh, Frankfurt School Board meeting will be October 13th. 